So for example, if you're a pretty good reader, then you would expect to be able to read something, right? So say we assign a value of one to the expectation. But if you don't put any value on what you're being asked to read, the value factor is zero. So you might be a good reader, but have no motivation to read. So what about if you really value, um, you really value something like I really value really good acting, but I have very little expectation that if you put me on a stage, I could act. So my expectation of success level is zero. And my value is high. My value is one. My expectation of success is zero. Am I going on stage acting? No way. I'm not motivated. Now, not to say that couldn't change. If somebody brought me in in such a way that it made it safe for me to feel that maybe I could expect it to succeed at the next little thing, if they said, oh, come on, it's just friends. We're doing it before friends. It's OK. You'll be fine. Nobody's looking, that kind of thing they might get me in and my expectation of success might go up. Or if the reading teacher said, it's okay, we're not gonna start with that text. You just go pick out something you want. Maybe it's vampire books or something like that. You just pick what you want, we'll read that. Then that person's value would go up. So that's the way that equation works. We're gonna be coming back to this all through the, the presentation. Let's listen to a few students talk about it and see if you can identify either factor, value, or expectation in what they're saying to us. Here's Darian. She's a chess player from New York City. It's just like, wow, how do they do that? That's amazing. You can't do that yet, but maybe one day you can. Do you hear value there? That's amazing, she says. Do you hear expectation? You can't do that yet, but maybe someday you can. Is that expectation? Does that count? All right, good. So here's Ruben. He's from San Antonio. His dad's an auto mechanic. Uh, when I first started working on cars, I was pretty young, in sixth grade, I guess. That came from my dad. He got me into doing that kind of stuff. I would change the oil, change spark plugs, change the brakes, take apart the engine and put it back together. I can do everything. Does Ruben have value? Yeah, his dad is doing it. He likes to hang out with his dad. Does he have expectation of success for himself? Yeah, I can do everything. I can change the oil, take apart the engine. Let's listen to Rachel. She's talking about working out a math problem in a small group. Once we got to like a certain point, I was just like, okay, I think I got this. Like, I can do this again. Does Rachel have value? We don't know, really, but she's there. Does she have expectation of success? So listening closely to kids, you can see the fires of motivation starting to light in their minds as they get going on a challenge. But we can also hear something else in what they say. Their motivation isn't just about getting started, because you can get started and not keep going. So I also asked young people what helped them stick with something through the long, hard period of practice on the way to getting really good at it. Let's listen. Here's what kids discovered. A lot of very different things kept these kids going, even when things got hard. You can see the hard part. The fun part really comes from everybody working on it together and making it a social experience. That was what really sparked me in the beginning. That's one factor. You need a hater and you need a motivator. A hater, like the person that putting you down, that's something you can't do it, that's your hater, and then you feel motivated to like prove them wrong, and then your motivator is a person that, you know, supporting you, so you kind of try your best on everything so you can make your motivator proud. That's Lanye. Let's listen to Taishina talk about competition. Competing at the end, there's always something kind of bigger than when you're performing, even though you feel the same way and stuff. I think the competition gets me more motivated because I know that in the end, I might win or lose, so it makes me like try harder. Sometimes the value just comes from the fun of it. One of my friends, whatever she liked, I liked, and she was like, oh my God, you have to read this book. I'm like, 
I do not want to read that because it's so thick. However, because I became so into that series, I was in the library almost every week and I was talking to the librarian. I was like, can you get me these books? That was Uma, and here's Dan. You're matching with the music perfectly, and you feel a reward inside you. It's not just a reward that's clear, like, oh, I'm winning the competition, we get a trophy. It's like an, almost like an inner trophy that you have. It's an inner win for you that you've overcome something of yourself, and you feel proud of yourself. So in different ways, all these students are talking about the kind of motivation that comes from inside us, aren't they? Not from people telling us what to do. They, sometimes it's just the satisfaction of it. Sometimes it's proving somebody wrong. Somebody, sometimes it's wanting to win the competition and show that you're the best. Sometimes it's just fun. And sometimes it's just that satisfaction of knowing inside yourself, not for anybody else, that you know it. But nonetheless, there's one more absolutely critical ingredient that brings us to a high level of performance. And that element is practice. But it's not just any practice, it turns out. It has to be a certain kind, which researchers call deliberate practice. So like most of us, kids get the idea of this special kind of practice because they have experienced it already in all kinds of things they learn, many of them outside of school. For example, let's listen to Takara compare her favorite hobby, which is cartooning, to getting better at softball, which is another thing she likes to do. I draw cartoons. Well, how to get better at drawing, I just draw pictures that I like and try to draw pictures that are hard to me. Like in sports, to get better, you go step by step. It's kind of the same, because in art, you got to go step by step and you got to take your time in order to learn it and to like really get it. So you can hear Takara analyzing her own learning there. She's doing it. She's picking it apart. Where does her motivation come and how is it? What does it take to, for her to get really good at things? And here are Dan and Taishina, two eighth graders from a middle school where ballroom dance is an option for gym class. Anybody ever see Mad Hot Ballroom? The, the school that these kids went to competes in that contest uh, for uh, best middle school ballroom dancers. By the way, sometimes when I listen to Dan and Taishina, I like to shut my eyes and pretend they're talking about learning in their classroom, some classroom subject, and imagine if they could be saying the same things about that. Nobody's perfect, and you don't get the steps right the first or second or three tries. You have to keep on trying, and don't worry if somebody else on the side who's like going faster, because everybody has their own different learning paces, so that's okay. For me, it's actually easier when a lot of people in the class don't know what's going on, and you see, oh, they're making a mistake, so I could maybe work on that for me a little bit more. And once you do that, it bounces off and back to them, and they see it. So it's much more of a working community. So you can hear in everything these students say that they're starting to become experts in expertise. They're actually getting good at getting good. So I'm going to stop you for a minute or two now and ask you to ask yourself, how would you describe your own practice, your own process, when you are practicing whatever it is that you practice? Again, could be in your workplace or it could be in your life outside. So just take one minute each, no more, and describe your own practice, what you practice and how you practice it. 